Houston, we've had a problem. As the flight director of a space flight, hearing those words could make you age in minutes. Yet during the flight of Apollo 13, these exact words were spoken. Hey there, welcome back to my YouTube channel. In today's video, we will be taking a look at NASA's near disaster, Apollo 13. If you haven't seen the previous videos on Apollo 11 and 12, check them out and subscribe so you don't miss out on more interesting stories about the Apollo program. Apollo 13 Apollo 13 was NASA's third flight to the surface of the moon. This trip to the moon was meant to further and complete the experimental work that Apollo 11 and 12 had started on the lunar surface. The crew of Apollo 11 had left a seismometer on the surface, but it was powered by solar energy and it didn't last the two-week-long lunar night. Apollo 12 brought another seismometer as part of the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments package. This unit was nuclear powered so it could last longer. The focus of the Apollo 13 was on experiments and scientific processes. Apollo 12 already demonstrated that precision landing can be achieved, so the path had already been paved for Apollo 13, but things didn't go as planned. Space travel is filled with a lot of uncertainties, even today in the 21st century. With the success of the first two moon landings, the astronauts that were slated to be a crew for the Apollo 13 mission had more time to train. Over a thousand hours were spent on mission-specific training, learning how to fly their designated modules, and on learning how to describe what they see to a room filled with scientists. Their focus was on geology as scientists back on Earth were eager to study what secrets the surface of the moon held. The crew of Apollo 13 had James A. Lovell Jr. as Mission Commander CDR, John Jack L. Swigger Jr. as Command Module Pilot CMP, and Fred W. Hayes Jr. as Lunar Module Pilot LMP. James Lovell was a very experienced astronaut. He was 42 years old at the time of the mission and had already flown on three space flights before Apollo 13. However, for Jack Swigger and Fred Hayes, it would be their first and only space flight. Looking at the Apollo program's roster, these astronauts should have been the backup crew for Apollo 13 instead of being the prime crew. Gordon Cooper should have been the commander, with Don F. Eisel as CMP and Edgar Mitchell as LMP. But they were switched out of prime crew assignments because of Cooper's lax attitude to training and Eisel's infidelity in incidents while he was aboard Apollo 7. Jack Swigger wasn't slated to be part of the prime crew for Apollo 13. He was briefed and asked to join the team 48 hours before launch after Ken Mattingly was exposed to rubella, German measles. If the crew had known about the fate that would befall their flight, maybe they might have agreed to switch to places and roles with other astronauts. The spacecraft used for Apollo 13 was not so different from Apollo 12. The command module was given the call sign Odyssey, while the lunar module had the call sign Aquarius. At the time of its flight, Apollo 13 was the heaviest spacecraft to be flown by NASA. It was carrying extra propellant as a test because future missions to the moon would be heavier due to the extra payload from experimental and scientific equipment. The launch date of Apollo 13 was moved back from March 12 to April 11. NASA planned to have at least two Apollo mission flights in a year, but after the success of Apollo 11, the public lost interest in the Apollo program. The Congress began to cut their support and funding. Due to a lack of funds, NASA had to cancel the planned Apollo 20. The Launch On April 11 at 2.13 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the rocket launched into the skies. Compared to the previous launches, Apollo 13 took its time clearing the launch pad. It was slower because it carried more payload than the previous two flights. An anomaly occurred during the launch. The second stage center engine shut down two minutes before it was supposed to. The shutdown was caused by something known as a pogo oscillations. Pogo oscillation happens when the propellant used for the rockets vibrates into an excited state, and if left unchecked, it could lead to catastrophic engine failure. Since Apollo 10, all the spacecraft had their guidance systems programmed to shut down the engine in response to pressure changes in the propellant chambers. Pogo oscillations increased pressure on the frame of the rocket, so the engines were automatically shut down to check the oscillations. This wasn't the first time NASA had witnessed pogo oscillations, which used to happen in the earlier Titan rockets that were used for the Gemini project. They even had a way to prevent these oscillations, but due to pressure on the schedule of the Apollo 13, they didn't integrate the hardware into the spacecraft. A post-flight investigation carried out on the engine showed that it was one cycle away from failure. The third stage of the rocket compensated for the shutdown by burning longer than it was supposed to. 
With the third stage of the rocket burning longer, Apollo 13 was able to reach parking orbit. Two hours later, the astronauts initiated the translunar injection and sent Apollo 13 on course to the moon. After the translunar injection, Jack Swigger performed the separation and transposition maneuver, docked the command module with the lunar module, and separated the third stage of the rocket from the rest of the craft. Ground controllers sent the third stage on a course to impact the surface of the moon, close to the site where Apollo 12 left their seismometer. The Trip to the Moon Learning from the previous flights, NASA took more steps to ensure that the astronauts would not be caught in a pinch. In the Apollo 11 mission, there was a problem with navigation that caused the lunar module to land way off course. The landing had to be done manually by Neil Armstrong so that the spacecraft does not end up getting smashed into pieces by rocks and boulders present in their new landing site. Neil was pressed for time as he landed with less than a minute worth of fuel left. Although Apollo 12 has proven that precision landing could be done, NASA didn't want to take anything to chance. They had Apollo 13 stocked with more fuel than usual, so they have more than enough for the descent to the lunar surface. After the anomaly with the second stage of the engine during launch, the crew had not experienced any other problems with the spacecraft and system performance was optimal until the 56th hour of the mission. The pressure sensor and oxygen tank too appeared to be malfunctioning. The ground crew responsible for monitoring the command service module electrical systems asked that the steering fan be turned on, so the contents of the tank can be measured more accurately. The fans in the cryogenic oxygen tank were turned on almost 56 hours after the spacecraft launched from Earth. About two seconds after engaging the fans, electrical shorts in the circuits of the fans ignited wire insulation, which resulted in an increase in temperature and pressure in cryogenic tank 2. When the pressure in the tank increased to 1,008 psi, the relief flow valve activated and the pressure began to decrease. After about 9 seconds, the relief valve was reset and the pressure began to increase again. A vibration began and it registered on the accelerometers of the command module. The next events happened within a fraction of a second, an explosion occurred and the oxygen tanks of the service module were expelled into space. The astronauts heard a bang that was accompanied by fluctuations in electrical power, and the attitude control thrusters were going crazy. The explosion took out one of the dishes of the high-gain antenna, data transfer was lost for about 1.8 seconds as the antenna switched from narrow to wide beams due to the damage. Upon hearing the bang, Lovell thought Hayes was playing his jokes on them again. Hayes activates the cabin pressurization valve, which also produces a bang upon activation. He does it from time to time so he could startle his crewmates. When Lovell looked at Hayes, he saw that he was also looking confused about what was going on. Swigger was thinking about something entirely different. He thought maybe a meteoroid struck the LM so he began to look for leaks with Lovell. Lovell quickly realized that there were no leaks. They realized that the three fuel cells of the service module were not producing enough electricity to power the command module. Almost everything in the CM required electricity to run. So at that point, the astronauts knew that they had a problem. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. Swigert and Lovell reported back to Mission Control with Swigger saying, Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. Mission Control replied, This is Houston, say again, please. At this point, Lovell echoed back, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus under volt. In the minutes that followed after the accident, there were a lot of unusual readings something that you would expect after an explosion just occurred. The reading showed that oxygen tank 2 was empty and the pressure in tank 1 was slowly falling. The readings also showed that the antenna had stopped working and the computer on board the spacecraft had undergone a reset. Back in Mission Control, the focus was on the readings from tank 1. They believe that the reading from tank 2 is just a minor instrumentation problem and that the reading from tank 1 would help them determine how much oxygen was left. But they were wrong. Lovell looked out the window at this point and reported back that he was seeing some gas venting out to space. The fuel cell in the command service module needed oxygen to operate, so as soon as the oxygen in tank 1 ran out, the fuel cell would shut down. This would mean that the command service module will have to depend on batteries and oxygen from the surge tank to operate. The remaining fuel cell was already drawing from the surge tank, due to the rapidly depleting store of oxygen in the tanks. The surge tank is usually kept intact, as it would be needed for the final hours of the mission. Mission Control asked the astronauts to isolate the surge tank so that the entire store of oxygen would not be used up entirely. The Cold Journey Back 
Apollo 13 can no longer continue the journey to the moon, so it became NASA's priority to bring them safely back home. The lunar module is usually reserved to entry and exit from the moon, so it had fully charged batteries and its oxygen tanks were still intact. Just like a scenario from a sinking ship, Mission Control directed the astronauts to power the lunar module and use it as a lifeboat. During mission training for Apollo 10, this scenario was anticipated but considered highly unlikely, so much emphasis wasn't placed on it. In the training scenario, the lunar module didn't even power up in time so that the astronauts could make the switch. If the accident had occurred after Lovell and Hayes had been on their moonwalk, all three astronauts would have died. The lunar module would have been jettisoned or its oxygen reserves and batteries would have been depleted. The lunar module was designed to support two men on the surface of the moon for two days, but Mission Control did a great job of creating new procedures so that the LM can support three men for the next four days. The journey back home was cold and uncomfortable. Mission Control decided that it would not use the service module's main engine to abort the flight and take astronauts on a trajectory back to Earth. They weren't sure if the engine had been damaged by the explosion or not. Instead of taking the risk, NASA decided to take a longer route and send the spacecraft to the moon and have it swing back to Earth using the moon's orbit. The astronauts had to deal with issues like a lack of potable water, a low temperature as low as 3 degrees Celsius, and the problem of removing carbon dioxide. Each astronaut was limited to 0.2 liters of water per day and using instructions from mission control back on Earth. The astronauts were able to fix the carbon dioxide removal issue. Due to reduced water intake, one of the astronauts, Hayes, suffered from a urinary tract infection. If you have enjoyed watching this video, click the like button and subscribe so you don't miss out on other interesting content from this channel.